Today's video is sponsored by Jobber, but more on that later. Hi, this is Brad with Copper Creek Cuts, a lawn care company in Northeast Florida. Today's video is about the largest job I have ever done in my seven years of running my own lawn care landscaping business. It's the biggest in terms of the amount of time that it took. It's the biggest in terms of man hours. It's the biggest in terms of both gross and net profit and build amount and basically every single way you could think of a job being the biggest this was it. This is going to be a long video. If you're looking for something specific, please use the chapters. You can see those in the description box and in the first comment if you scroll down. If you're willing to watch the whole thing, then I'm willing to share everything I have learned from this job that could help you. If you're planning on taking on really any type of project work in your business, if you are trying to get into the stormwater management area, if you aren't 100% familiar with the channel for the first three or four years of my channel, I was kind of the tall grass mowing guy. That's what I did and that's how I got a lot of my early success. There are so many folks doing that now that the formula of what makes a successful video has changed a bit. When I started doing it, showing the work was enough, but now you've really got to show the person behind it and exploit their story and I never felt comfortable with that. So I don't make too many of those videos nowadays. I just focus on the business side with the hopes of helping other people who are in business or just entertaining people who like watching this kind of stuff. Something that's helped me focus on the business more is this stormwater management side of work that I've gotten into over the past year. And so that's kind of the first thing I want to talk about is what is stormwater management and how did I get into it? So what you're seeing me walk around is a retention basin. When you build new construction, whether that's a home, or whether that is a, uh, a shopping center that has a parking lot. You are taking permeable surfaces, which means that water can go through them, so dirt, grass, trees, and you are replacing them with impermeable surfaces, surfaces that water cannot absorb into, the concrete parking lot, uh, the roof of the Costco or the Walmart that you're shopping in. Water runs off those. So now you have this plot of land where water would manage itself naturally by being absorbed into the ground, and you've turned it into something where if you don't manage that water, it'll create a deluge, right? Because all that water during a rain event just rushes off somewhere to the lowest point. That's where stormwater management comes in. You will have retention basins, dry ponds, wet ponds. You'll have detention basins. You'll have all these different types of structures that are built to manage that water that now has nowhere to go because of the surfaces that you've built. This is one of them. This is a retention basin. As a quick side note, the difference between a retention basin or a detention basin, think about when you got detention in school, they held you for a little bit of time. A detention basin does the same thing. Normally it's dry, but it'll temporarily store rainwater runoff until it can take time to slowly dissipate, then it's dry again. A retention pond holds it all the time. It's always gonna have some level of water in it. You know, unless you get like some crazy drought and it all evaporates, but it's designed to normally have water in it. So stormwater management is the jobs that go along with making sure those systems stay in good repair. Because I started making videos with my Ventrac, which is a machine that is a compact articulating and oscillating tractor. You can attach up to eight wheels to it, so it does really well in very soft and muddy areas, and it doesn't really tear up ground. And it's got a bunch of attachments, so you can you know mow tall grass with it. You can mow. You can make it look like a really nice finished cut. You can do all kind of things with it. But because I have that machine, which is especially suited for mowing in wet, slope, steep areas, the kind of things you would find in a stormwater management system. There's a company that has a ton of national contracts for stormwater management, and I believe they're getting to a point where they're, they're kind of shifting from having their own people do the work to subcontracting a lot of stuff. If you've got, like, let's say your closest crew of guys is three hours away and there's a multi-day project. Well, by the time you pay two or three guys per diems, fuel, lodging, uh, the gas of the, the truck that takes them there, the wear and tear of the tires on the trailers, on the trucks, the equipment that you need to send with them. You know, they're just realizing some stuff is going to be a better deal if we can just get somebody close by to do it. 
which led them to try and find people with certain equipment, which led them to finding me and the Ventrac videos I made. So that's really how I got into it is because I had that Ventrac and had made videos on it. They had reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this kind of work. We see you've got a machine that would do a lot of it. Are you interested? And yes, I was. And that leads us to this job. This is the biggest one that I've ever done, period. And as you can see from the walk around, there is a ton of natural growth in this retention basin. And there's not supposed to be. So I, I actually, in one instance while I was working, got to talk to the guy who does the lawn for this location. And he said that back in the day, he used to take care of the property around nine years ago. And he also took care of the growth inside of that basin, but that he lost the contract. He was away for five or six years. When he came back, somebody else had the contract and they had not been maintaining the inside. I think another couple years went by before he was able to get the lawn care contract again. So some of this stuff, and you can see these trees are 30 feet tall. You know, I, I measured it with the drone as I took them up. Some of this stuff is very likely eight to 10 years of growth. And it's, it's not hard to believe when you think about how tall these trees are. So all this stuff, it's not supposed to be there. The roots interfere with the structure of the uh, concrete walls of the retention basin. Obviously, you're going to have natural wildlife inhabiting this area that really shouldn't be in there either. You're going to have a lot of mess. You're just going to have a ton of things go wrong that you're not supposed to have because you let nature take over. So my mission, should I have chosen to have accepted it, does anybody get that reference? Was to clear this basin out. All the stuff's gotta go. All of it's gotta go. To say I was overwhelmed <laughs> would have been an understatement. So my wife and I drove out to take a look at this property on a Sunday afternoon and uh, wow. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know if I can physically handle this. I don't know if I'm equipped for this. But it's one of those things where I'm, I'm kind of at the school of thought where if you don't do things that are uncomfortable or outside of your skill set, you're never going to learn new skills. And it paid a crap ton of money. So <laughs> to put it indelicately. <laughs> so it was one of those things where... I am very apprehensive about this. I think this is gonna be a huge drain on me physically and mentally and emotionally, uh, but I think they're paying me enough that I can deal with that. So, so I recorded every single day I was there, partially because you needed pictures to prove that you did the work. But of course, the other reason was to make this video for you folks. So the work that I'm doing now, my goal on this first day was simply to get everything away from the fence and everything away from the concrete block that that's what I would have to walk on. The, the whole perimeter of this retention pond, retention basin, is lined with concrete block that is gonna be the main way I walk around. And I, I really have no access right now because this overgrowth has crept so much. So for the first day, all I wanted to do was clear the fence off of the weeds. I wanted to clear that concrete block so I had sure footing for walking around. I wanted to get any trees that had limbs blocking that path. I wanted to get rid of those. And you see that I'm kind of just throwing it back into the basin to clean up for another day. This was one of the first things that I learned I had underestimated on this job. This retention basin is four feet deep uh, from the top of that concrete wall to the bottom. There is more depth once you start, you know, getting down into the slopes of it. And then there's also this four foot fence that wraps all the way around. So one thing that I did not properly appreciate, and if you ever have a job like this that you should, is the amount of effort it is going to take to get material manually from whatever ground level it's at up eight to 12 feet. Not to mention on top of that, the effort to get it from on the ground over the fence to your trailer. Day one ends with some trash pickup. Now on day two, I've brought my pole saws. This is a Toro 60 volt that I'm using. I also have an Echo that I think 16 feet is its max reach. And so that's what I'm doing today is, is cutting back these really tall trees before I can cut them down at the base because they're just so tall, there's, there's no real way to manage it. The other thing that I have to do is kind of create a beachhead. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but I need to create somewhere where I can get down into the bottom 
so I can start processing trees that way. All of this debris that I'm generating has to be deposited in the same county. So if you've never dealt with commercial waste, any kind of debris that comes from a business, the county that it resides in is the county's dump that will accept it. So like for instance, I live in Baker County, Florida. If I generate commercial waste in Baker County, Duval County's not gonna let me dump it there. It has to be in Baker County. So that presents a couple of logistical issues, one of which you'll see later on thanks to a hurricane. But part of me as a subcontractor for this company is that I'm required to get weight slips for all of the debris that I generate. So they can go back to the client and say, hey, this is how much we generated. Also, there's a lot of federal regulation about this kind of stormwater debris. It's not just normal yard waste, so you've got to treat it a certain way. So they need something so they can cover themselves and say, yes, we hire subcontractors who dispose of it properly, and Brad isn't just, you know, dumping it in a McDonald's dumpster somewhere. Here's the proof of it. Now I'm starting to finally open that bottom up, you can see, and I've got a, a little space to work on. Uh, the chainsaw that I used for this was a Toro 60 volt. The Toro 60 volt stuff, it worked so good. Uh, you'll see I, I really abused use it later on. The orange flags are stumps that I found. There's going to be a phase two of this that involves removing all those stumps. Again, none of that stuff is supposed to be there, but it's such difficult footing that I have to flag these, not only to know where they are, but it's also trip hazards for me. So this way I know where to be careful step. And again, day two ends with trash pickup. So here we are at the dump, unloading all this stuff so that we can get our weight slip. You drive onto a scale when you pull up, you unload, and then you drive onto the scale again when you leave. And so the difference is the amount of weight that you have dumped, and that's what you pay based on. I, I want to say they're, I can't remember, it was like $55 a ton for this type of debris. So every 2,000 pounds, you're paying 55 bucks. The good thing about a lot of this brush, at least for these first couple loads, is that it's very light. That changes later and things get a little bit heavier, but at least the first couple loads were uh, much more manageable. Uh, that wraps up day two. We're gonna head into day three here, which is pretty much some of the same work back on that trailer. I could think some people might say, you know, why don't you get a dump trailer? You need a dump trailer. That leads me to the second thing that I did not consider uh, or didn't really appreciate. The dump closed at 4 p.m. at this county. So that means with this job site, oh, hold on, look at this. Well, I'm impressed that's still running. Yeah, the GoPro is also something I abused a lot on this. <laughs> You'll see quite a few times I knock it over. But with the job site being an hour away from my house, there was no way I would ever be able to work enough to fill up a dump trailer before I had to go to the dump and leave it. And the other thing is, because my work schedule was staggered, I wasn't doing this eight days back to back. I was doing it as my schedule allowed a day at a time. So that means I couldn't really leave the trailer loaded for, you know, a night because the next day, odds are I needed it for mowing. So it's one of those things where if I generated waste and put it on the trailer, I had to get rid of it that day, which means I had to be at the dump before four o'clock. They shut the gate at four. So you have to be unloaded and paid out sooner than that, right? But again, a dump trailer would have been 200 something dollars a day. I would have had to go to the place to rent it. I would have had to hook it up. It just would, the dump trailer was more trouble than it's worth. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about getting a dump trailer. Are you actually gonna be able to do enough work to justify the cost and the time that getting that dump trailer would require. For me, no, it, it just made more sense to suck it up and do it all manual. Again, because if the dump closes at four, that's, that's the end of my work day. I can't work fast enough to process that much stuff and get it on the trailer. And this was much of day two, just cutting down trees, hauling them out. Again, the physical effort that it takes to move these things four to eight feet from the bottom of the pit to the top of the pit and then lift them up over the the fence or you know try and thread them through the 48 inch gate it, it was tough now this was right after hurricane adalia so unfortunately the dump was closed so i went there at the end of that last day 
and I had to keep it on the trailer till morning. And this meant that I had to change my work schedule around. I actually had to cancel on one project because I couldn't haul my Ventrac somewhere because the trailer was full. So the very beginning of this day was started at the dump when they opened back up two days after the hurricane came through. The hurricane, man, it, it really did a number on the area this job was in. And uh, they they were suffering for the next several weeks after. In fact, in, in that instance, that place didn't even have power so I could weigh in or out. I just had to, you know, write a letter and said, hey, these guys are completely out of power. There's no way for me to, you know, figure out how much I dumped that day. Uh, on the plus side, it was free. So that saved me a couple bucks, but still would have rather been able to do it the right way. One other thing I forgot to mention that was important was the travel time from the job site to the dump. So again, that was one of those time constraints that really had to be factored into whether or not I was able to keep working and I also had to clean up the job site. So my work days were really not as long as I thought they would be once I realized all the stuff I had to do. So now I've started to work on the other end. I can't remember if this is just because I needed a break from that one end or what, but, but here I am at the, uh, at the opposite end. Oh, I think it's because I had done a most of what I could from the one side of the parking lot, so I wanted to get some of this easy stuff from the other side of the parking lot. And again, it's just, it's just doing this mind-numbing work of cutting everything down and marking it and flagging it and, and lifting it up over the side. The one difference today, that blue hose that you'll see, now I'm actually starting to dewater this area, which means I'm pumping all the water out. So that, that outlet that you see with the grate off, that's where the water's supposed to go. So I have off screen a multi-quip pump, two inch trash pump, that is sucking water from a, a suction line. You can't see the suction line right now in this shot, but it is pumping it through the pump, through that blue discharge hose, into a dewatering bag and it's basically draining out that way so i have to do this so that i can get to the rest of all these trees that are underwater and that i can also see what's going on with the structure underneath if anything but again it's just at this point i'm just cutting everything i can reach which is starting to be not a ton because of how high the water is that was another huge issue i had was because of my staggered work schedule I could have days where I would spend to watering and then a rainstorm would come and I'd have to, I'd, you know, I'd, I wouldn't make any progress because as soon as I came back, I'd have to dewater again just to get back to where I was. That happened once or twice. That was a real pain. But, but that's something that even if I had a schedule where I could be there five, six, eight days straight, that could still happen if I leave and it rains. Kind of a pain, but you know, what are you going to do? So now we're coming up on the end of this day, the beginning of day five, and at this point in the video, I'm going to assume you've got some interest in business. So I'll talk a little bit about Jobber because they have emailed me once a year since I started my YouTube channel trying to get me to try their software out. Now, if you don't know, Jobber is a CRM, customer relationship management tool that basically let you run your business. Some people do pen and paper. CRM is a software that lets you avoid that, does a lot of things better, makes you a lot more professional. But I've always turned them down because up until now, I've only been mowing a few days a week, right? I don't need software as robust as Jobber. I've used Yardbook this entire time. I've got nothing bad to say about it. It's great software for what I use it for, which is just a simple mowing route, right? It, it routes things, it lets me bill, it makes me look a lot more professional when it comes to invoices and estimates. The one thing I will say is that when it comes to projects, Yardbook does not have as many tools as Jobber. And the reason I want to try Jobber out is because projects like this, you have the opportunity to make a lot of money on them or lose your shirt completely. So there are so many things I ran into that I need to track as expenses. There's about 30 minutes of loading and unloading the trailer and truck at the beginning and end of every day of the equipment I need at home. There's the drive time, which for this job was about an hour, hour and 10 minutes each way. In that travel time, I'm consuming fuel. I'm depreciating the vehicle from the wear and tear. Over the course of this project, I had about $3,600 in expenses. A huge portion of that, I believe about $2,600, was the purchase of a lot of tools and supplies that I didn't have in order to complete the job. That trash pump was the biggest one. But then like I also spent, uh, I think 200 something dollars on uh, very large traffic cones for blocking the area off. 
I had to buy some temporary fencing in case the fence came down. I spent, I think, $150 on three 4x4 posts that were 12 feet long and some screws to join them together in case I needed to build a ramp, in case I needed to get machinery down into the pit. Had to buy some large channel lock pliers for that pump. I had to buy, I had to buy some shop rags so I could isolate the blue discharge hose from the concrete because it vibrates, so I didn't want it to wear out and I, I hadn't brought a towel from home. All kind of stuff that just added up that if you're not tracking, when you have another job to bid, you're not going to have all these things somewhere in a software that says, hey, these are what your expenses were. This is what your tax rate is. This is what you're going to have to pay attention to when you get into bidding this next thing. And Jobber does all that. It's got areas where you can track all these things and give you detailed information on your project, on the profitability of it. And then you can use that information the next time you have a project and you can get better and better at better at your billing, at your estimating. If you're just mowing a $45 lawn, and it should have been $47, that's not a huge deal, right? You can live with that. If you're bidding a $15,000 job and it should have actually been $20,000, well now that's going to be the difference between you making a nice profit and you not making any money at all. The margin for error is so much greater once you get into these larger projects. I finally feel like I'm at a point in the business where the cost of this software is justified because of the projects and the amount of money it could save you by being able to really drill down into your costs and understand what you need to bid for your future projects. I would say if you think you're going to get into projects or if you already do projects and want some more help in tracking them, there's a lot of stuff you can do with Jobber. So there's going to be a link in the description where they've given me a link that you can use for a free trial and you can see if it's something that you like or not. There's also a few features Jobber has that are going to save me time on the mowing side of things. That'll be a separate video. But again, a big thanks to Jobber for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. So one other thing I messed up with whenever I was estimating this job is not realizing how many breaks I would have to take. Most of the time I was working, it was in the 90s. There were a few days that topped the hundreds. There was one day where it was nice. I think it was the day after the hurricane. It was, you know, maybe 80s. But because this work was so manual and because pretty soon I didn't have any tree cover and it was all in the sun, man, I was baking. And this work, it's very labor intensive. And so what I was finding is that for about every 20 to 30 minutes of work that I did, I would have to go in the truck, turn on the AC, drink about 16 ounces worth of water and rest for five to 10 minutes just because of how hot it was. I know there's gonna be comments, well, I doubt they'll watch this far, but there's a lot of people who are like, ah, oh, just suck it up. Just where if you're only working for 20 minutes before you take a break you're a wuss and so there's a couple things that go into this one is I've been doing this long enough that I know my limits so when my body starts to feel a certain way usually what it is is when I can feel my heartbeat pounding a little bit in my head that's when I know I have redlined it too much I need to stop and sit down the other thing is if you don't have employees and you're the only one doing the work there can be a drive to push yourself to get it done Oh, this is really stupid. Look at this. That very morning, I had decided I wasn't going to pack two chainsaws anymore because I'd only been using one and didn't need a second as a backup. And then this happened. Yeah, so in that instance, when it was rolling down, I was like, this is, I'm such a stupid idiot. I'm going to have to go buy a chainsaw somewhere in this town because I didn't pack the Echo as a backup. Now, thankfully, the Toro ended up drying out. I've never cracked this thing open, so I don't know what's inside, but apparently you can dunk it in stagnant retention pond water. Just let it dry out for a minute or two, and it's still going to work fine. But on a job like this that I spent almost 90 man hours on, if you push through your body telling you to rest and you just keep going on, something's going to happen to you. Either heat exhaustion, if you don't listen then, heat stroke's going to set in. You're going to lose this job. If you've got employees, it's a little bit different story. But for me, I'm the only guy here. I'm the only one who's getting the work done. If I didn't stop and listen to my body, I'd be in a world of hurt. But I didn't realize when I was planning how long this was going to take, for every hour of work, I'm going to have to take 20 minutes worth of breaks. 
So I think at some point during my monologue, we slipped into day six. My goal for day six was just cut as much as I could. Because what was happening is if I'm leaving the house at seven or eight and I'm getting to the job site at nine or 10 and you know, an hour later, it takes 30 minutes to set that dewatering pump up. And then what I'm finding is that there's just not enough time to be productive before I have to start cleaning up around two or 2.30 so I can get to the dump around three so I can unload and be done around 3.30 so I can get out of there before they close at four. So I was like, all right, this day, I'm just gonna cut all day long. These trees, even though they're pretty tall, because of how light they are, I was able to control them really well. This one though got away from me and this happened. I'm telling you, man, they make these GoPros tough. Yeah, it zigged when I thought it was gonna zag. And I think this is one of the days where I started to be done with this project because uh, I had forgotten my tripods at home. So I was having to use the metal fence and a magnet to hold the camera. So I just set one up and then this happened. Yeah, you see, I don't have anything clever or funny to say after that. This is the point where I'm like, this is not fun anymore. This is just, yeah, it's it's a slog. There are quite a few times I fell or tripped or, and I've got some more of them on camera. That's another thing about long projects that you may need to realize. There was one really bad time for me. I think it was maybe day three or four where I, I had a little bit of a mini breakdown and I was like, why in the world did I take this job? I'm never gonna finish. I made a huge mistake doing this. Thankfully, I've had that happen before. And so I know, just give myself a couple minutes of a pity party. I went to the truck, I just sat quietly in the air conditioning. And then at the end of it, I said, you might be right. Maybe it was a mistake to take this job. Maybe you aren't suited for it but you did take the job. You're three days into it or four days into it, wherever I was at that point in time. And the only way it's ever gonna stop is if you finish the job. And to do that, you've gotta get out of the truck, you've gotta go, and you've gotta start cutting down one tree at a time, one palm frond at a time. And then you've gotta take that stick and you've gotta get it over the fence. And then you gotta put it in the, so like talking myself down off of that cliff. Again, if you've got employees, maybe it's different, but when you're the only person doing the work, the only time you're ever getting progress made is if you are physically working. So when you get to that point where you're just, you don't see light at the end of the tunnel and the last thing you want to do is crawl back down into that pit and start cutting again. Yeah, that was, I texted my wife and I was like, I'm okay now, but I had a bit of a mini breakdown. And so that was another thing that I got a good appreciation of is if you're going to take on a long project, you need to be ready for this thing to consume your life for, you know, the duration of it. And this might be something that guys who do projects all the time, they're just used to after a while and it becomes less stressful. But for me, it was it was a big deal is this is the biggest, longest project that I've ever done. Certainly the most work I've ever done by myself for a single customer. Then you've got a day like today where I'm making good progress, but everything seems to be going wrong. I'm slipping, I'm falling, I'm trying to break my camera. So everything ended up working out, but there are a lot of things in this job that if you can't handle little things, or if you get to a point where you're just done with something and you can't back yourself down from that position and realize, yes, this sucks, but at the end of the day, it's what you said you were gonna do, and the only way through it is to move forward, that might be something to consider about accepting really big projects. So at this point now, we're in day seven. Again, day six was just cutting everything I could. Day seven was immediately loading everything, seeing what was left, basically working until I had to go to the dump again to beat that uh, time limit of them closing. Another thing that I learned that worked out really well for me was keeping everyone updated. So I had the contractor who hired me and I had the staff at this store that every single morning when I arrived at the job site, I sent a text to the contractor and let them know I was on site. And I went in the very first day, introduced myself to the, the folks working at the, at the job site. And every morning I would say, hey, I'm here, just wanna let you know. And then at the end of every day, I texted the contractor when I left the job site and I touched base with the store and said, hey, I'm done. 
this is everything I got done today. This is my plan for the next day I'm here, and this is when I think I'll be by next. So I had a, a lot of positive feedback from both parties about my communication during this job, and I also think that some of the times that I had to leave debris on site, the folks were okay with it. Well, one, because, you know, it's not really a customer-facing area. But again, because I was communicating with them every day and saying, hey, this looks a little bit messy today because I can't get to the dump because it's closed for the hurricane. It's going to be, you know, the next time I swing by, this will be my priority. You know, people just appreciate that. And I can't find it. I've tried before, but when I was in college, which is a very long time ago, there was some course where I looked at uh, some kind of a report. The numbers, I don't remember what they were, but the basic point was that most people will be much more tolerant of delays. They can wait for a lot longer than you would think if you just keep them updated, if they just know about it. So that's one thing that I found very helpful when it comes to projects or work or anything like that is letting people know, look, this is what's going on. This is why I can't do this. I'm trying to but this is gonna be the, the timetable. This middle section was so soupy. I, I don't even know how I could have gotten a machine down here if I wanted to, but to support its own weight in that middle, it's nothing but muck. And that's, I think, another side effect of letting this biomatter be here for, you know, eight or nine years is just, as it breaks down, it just turns into this sludge where if it was just dirt and grass, there wouldn't be that much stuff down in the middle that's real mucky. I didn't have any energy to film unload, and so there's just one picture of me at the dump. I was like, oh, that's my proof. Finally, we're at day eight, which is the last day. So when I started, I was fairly certain this would be the last day, and I wanted to make it the last day. I did think day seven would have been the last one, but a few hours into it, I realized, no, I've, I've still got quite a bit more work to do. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned, I've just been using for all these things that weren't trees, the vines, the grasses, these cattails, that Toro 60 volt hedge trimmer, it's a commercial one, the Revolution series. It actually worked really good. Um, I also used a DeWalt pruner, a hand pruner, but I think that hedge trimmer would have been the way to go for all of it. If I could do it over again, I'd probably just use that from the beginning. Cleaning this stuff up was one of the more difficult and time consuming parts because of how much junk there was on the ground. The bow rakes catching on everything that's not cut flush and all that kind of stuff. But that was one of the more difficult parts of the job was the cleanup. I would definitely recommend giving more thought to the cleanup portion of a job if you're quoting one, if it's a project, especially if it's something like this where it's in a difficult area to get out. You know, you've got to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time for the labor that it's going to take to get the debris from this spot onto the trailer. And again, this was a location that, man, it was just, it was a real bear to get stuff out of this pit all the way to the trailer. Took a lot more physical effort than I anticipated and also a lot more time. I also slip a lot more on this day because these banks, again, are super slick. They're super mucky and um, it's just like mud and slime and everything. So very difficult terrain working in this area. And again, you see that blue discharge hose that's going from the pump to the outlet to try and get that water level down a little bit more. I'm not going to be able to get the water all the way down because what I find is that in, in another couple inches, the, all that's left is just like muck and sludge. And so as soon as I put the strainer basket underwater, it fouls and clogs itself and the pump isn't actually moving any water. So that's really the only portion of this job that I wasn't able to complete 100%. But again, that's a side product of not taking care of this thing for 10 years. Big milestone, these are the last trees. The liquid that remains is not just going to be simple water. It's going to be this pond water that is a combination of all the leaves and sticks and creatures that have died in this retention basin over the past 10 years and decayed and become part of it. So let's see what else. I think some people might comment something along the lines of, why don't I have an employee or I need an employee or something like that? While I will admit that there might be some folks who are okay just doing, you know, kind of like part-time work or, or project-based work, I don't know if it's a good fit for me. I, I did have somebody who I was trying to get hired on as an as-needed helper, but the timing on the paperwork, it didn't work out for this job, so I wasn't able to do that. But I will say, I, I don't know if I would have known what to do with an employee, so I would have been super nervous. A lot of this job was walking 
around this retention basin on the top of that concrete block. When I get my first employee, I'm gonna have to purchase workman's comp insurance. My expenses are gonna go up quite a bit. So I don't know one, if an employee is gonna be worth it. An employee would have to be happy with just working once in a blue moon when I have projects like these. So the pool of people that I'd be able to pick from is probably gonna be a little bit smaller. And the bigger thing on this job, like that first day, I don't know what I would have done. I guess I could have given an employee a shovel and said, go the other direction, scrape this concrete block off and meet me on the other end. But there's a lot of things where I feel like it wouldn't have been, oh, here's a good fall. This one really hurt. I tried to put on a smile, but man, I smacked the ever loving mess out of one of my butt cheeks. It, I think I had a bruise and uh, yeah, it wasn't funny to me either. It wouldn't have been two times efficiency having two people on site because especially those first few days where I was getting my bearings and I was trying to create a space to work, I'm not sure two people would have made those things go faster. It could have, but I, I'm just not sure what I would have done with them. The biggest reason I'm glad I didn't have somebody on this job was because of how dangerous it was. I mean, you saw how many times I slipped, how many times I fell. Somebody who's not used to this kind of thing, who hasn't been doing it day in, day out, I don't know if they would have wanted to do this. Even picking up trash you're seeing now, I'm slipping and sliding all over the place trying to finish this job out. So will I ever get an employee? I don't know. I, I don't really want one because my work is not five days a week. I mow two days a week. I've got projects that crop up. I've got YouTube that I take care of. So I really am not like a nine to five type guy. I don't have the reliability to employ somebody full time or even regular part time for that matter. This here I slip, I cannot get my footing back. Like the, the muck is so bad, I have to hobble over to this stump and then climb up and out. There's supposed to be a phase two of this project, which is getting all those stumps out. I'm gonna have to find some way to get an excavator down there. I don't know how, but I think it's gonna have to be during a, a very dry month, like January, February, something like that. So this was a nice end to the job. This is my last dump run of this whole project. And there's a county guy who took pity on me. He's like, uh, you want some help? I was like, yes, please, thank you so much. So he took what was probably gonna be a 15 or 20 minute unload job and he turned it into like, you know, two and a half minutes. So big thanks to this guy, whoever he is. I didn't get his name. He was, as soon as he was done, he started driving away to, to dump his load. But this was very, very helpful thing he did and uh, was a really nice way to wrap up the job. All the trash that I collected, it was just one bag, surprisingly, but it was also so light that the meter attendant was like, it's not gonna, it's not gonna register. That's the way to do it. I took some pictures and took photos of me dumping the trash and saying this was the trash that I generated, but unfortunately I couldn't weigh it. Again, weighing the trash is a big thing of this, uh, the, the contractor that I have for proving what was deposited. So in this instance, I just had to take pictures of it and, uh, and that was it. So now, project is all wrapped up. I'm going to go ahead and finally shut up and let you enjoy all the before and after and during pictures set to some music. If you've got any questions, whether it's about the project work or about job or anything, please feel free to shoot me a text. It's not very hard to find that. You just, you know, Google me and it'll pop up. But I really appreciate you watching. I'll see you in the next one.